In Australia, it seems just about everyone loves a punt, including cashed up criminals. How good has that job of protecting the integrity of racing been in your view? It, it's not been good at all. It's been very ex uh, extremely poor and uh, in part brought about because uh, you know, the, the stewards themselves who look after those codes haven't got the teeth. Um, they're not investigators for a start. The sport of kings and the occasional crook. Welcome to Four Corners. Colourful racing identities have always been a part of racing, even though the term has often been a euphemism for shady characters who might be up to no good. Understandable when you consider the number of race meetings taking place around the country every day of the week, with billions of dollars changing hands each year. Those billions invariably include an unknown amount of illegally obtained money, usually from drugs, that washes through the betting system and comes out clean. One drug baron is reputed to have laundered $80 million in this fashion. Our story tonight shows how corruption and criminal behaviour on the track are widespread and increasingly difficult to scrutinise. That while horse racing authorities and police often have parallel interests, there's far less cooperation than you might think. And that police are now taking a close interest in some of Australian racing's best known names. One trigger for renewed police interest in the industry has been their investigation into the murder of racing identity Les Samba in Melbourne. And Victoria Police today announced a reward of $1 million for information leading to the arrest of his killer or killers. Reporter Nick McKenzie has been investigating corruption in sport since last year and this joint investigation by Four Corners and The Age newspaper is the result. It's just after nine o'clock on a Sunday night as a guest at Melbourne's exclusive Crown Metropole Hotel heads out in his hire car. Les Samba, a colourful Sydney racing and business figure, is in town for the thoroughbred Yearling Sales. But tonight, he's on his way to a fateful rendezvous. For some unknown reason, he had a, an appointment uh, in Beaconsfield Parade and he went to that spot, why he went there and who uh, lured him there, we don't know. So that, that's what we're asking the public to uh, really put those last few, few moments uh, to, together for us. Now why you would decide to meet someone in a street when you were in a major hotel, you could have come in, they could have come to see you, had coffee, perhaps he didn't want to be seen with those people. That's why he chose that what he thought was neutral ground. Samba had a history of dubious business and racing connections. He once worked for Sydney gangster Abe Saffron and more recently was a close associate of Sydney property developer Ron Medich, who is presently facing murder charges in New South Wales. He certainly showed no indication that he was uh, in fear of his life. However, he was a fellow who, who knew some very dangerous people. There were business dealings which were non-racing, um, which could have gone pear-shaped. He was entrepreneurial, and so he went where the money was. So he had many colourful friends, some of them with short tempers. As he parked his car and made his way along the dark street, Les Samba was apparently unaware that he was walking into an ambush. Middle Park, one of Melbourne's most affluent suburbs, last night became the scene of what police say was a premeditated hit. The ambulance unit attended the scene, but this male was, uh, was found deceased. Mr Samba began to run, but was shot several times in his body and head. This is a clearly horrific incident to happen in a residential street in Melbourne. One of the city's most upmarket Bayside addresses became the site of a major homicide investigation over the following days. Police seemed sure of an early breakthrough. We're confident that we will solve this case. Uh, we have a number of persons of interest that we're currently looking at and uh, we'll continue to work through this case. 
Almost 18 months later, the murder of Les Samba remains unsolved. But tonight, Four Corners can reveal that the police investigation has lifted the lid on allegations of organised crime networks and high-level corruption in horse racing. Is it correct to say that it's opened up a real can of worms in respect of racing corruption? And if so, how big a can of worms? Well, what I can say is that uh, it's, we, we've had to have a look at the racing industry and uh, in doing that as a part of our investigation, we need to have a look at has organised crime influential uh, racing in, in Victoria and racing anywhere within Australia. Within weeks of the shooting, Les Samba's daughter, Victoria, made an emotional public plea for information. My dad has been taken from us in such a horrific way, but no one can take away the beautiful memories I have of him. Victoria Samba was married to leading jockey, Danny Nikolic, who has steered his mounts to victory in some of the nation's biggest races, including the Caulfield Cup. Nikolic and Victoria Samba had separated some time before Les Samba was gunned down. Les had involved himself hands-on in looking after his daughter, which created some bad blood. And that's one of the areas, of course, police naturally would look at. Detectives soon turned their attention to Danny Nikolic, along with others in the racing world, hoping for any clue that would shed light on Les Samba's murder. Is Danny Nicolick or his brother John persons of interest in the ongoing investigation? They're people we, we have spoken to and we'd probably like to speak to further, as is a number of other people in the racing industry. In fact, Danny Nicolick, the, the jockey, voluntarily went to police uh, and spoke to them. And that was a long time ago and he hasn't been charged, so he, of course, should be afforded the presumption of innocence. Racing, great line out, fast away, Dubai Opera sped to the lead from Cyclone Sarah Stacks on Max and Tycoon Rob going fast with smoking aces as they saw... Two months later, Danny Nicklick was back in the saddle for a race at Cranbourne on Melbourne's southeastern fringe. His smoking aces... His horse was called Smoking Aces. Then ...getting back in the field by retaliating... During the race, the stewards responsible for guarding the integrity of the sport were watching closely. Opera and Smoking Aces wins first up from... To the eyes of experienced turf watchers, it was a masterful win by Danny Nicklick. So Patrick, how's uh, Nicklick's run at the moment? Nicklick's riding the, the absolutely magic race. Um, he's, uh, he's aware of the favourite, where it is. He's aware... That Watching that race, would the average punter have, have sniffed something unusual? I couldn't see. No, I, I, there was good and bad luck, and it went the way of Danny, and it didn't go the way of the favourite. What was unusual was the relatively heavy betting on Danny Nicklick's horse on the day of the race, and the identity of the punters who collected up to $200,000 in winnings. What's more, the stewards weren't alone in scrutinising the outcome of the race. Are you investigating race fixing? Uh, that is one of the allegations that, that has been levelled, yes. And is there a certain race in particular under, under investigation? There, there, there is a certain race under investigation uh, that uh, we've been made, made aware of that we need to have a look at. And that's the race at, at Cranbourne, the ride of smoking aces? That is correct, yes. The alleged conduct of certain prominent racing figures in connection to the ride of smoking aces here at Cranbourne casts this huge cloud over the sport. It also raises questions about whether authorities and governments have been failing to safeguard an industry worth billions. The whole vision of, uh, of a sport, uh, particularly racing, is that the best animal is going to win on its own merits. And anything that detracts from that is Disgraceful. Racing is entirely dependent or significantly dependent on the gambling dollar and it's important that people have confidence when they do place a bet that they're going to get a run for their money.
From gala metropolitan race meetings to midweek country fixtures, racing is big business. Last year, Australians spent more than $14 billion betting on thoroughbreds. The track has long been a draw card for punters representing a cross-section of society, including cashed-up criminals who've been targeting the sport for decades. Now, in Melbourne, you major gangsters can't actually go and knock on the door of the Melbourne club and come in and meet judges over Stilton and Port. But in the racing industry, people just blend in. And inside information is the currency of the day. By the late 1970s, Robert Trimboli had graduated from the king of the Griffith marijuana trade to membership of a crime syndicate which imported millions of dollars worth of heroin into Australia. According to New South Wales intelligence reports, at one stage he had 13 jockeys on his payroll. His um, diary when it was seized had numbers of judges, racing officials, jockeys, uh, race callers and there were a series of illegal phone taps put on his phone before he fled Australia in 1981. And those tapes showed him talking to jockeys routinely, um, getting tips, and even sharing tips with police. His bets used to be $20,000 uh, cash. He still lost money. But it's not about making a profit, because if you can turn, say, 100% of dirty money into 75% clean money through the track, you're in front. From their first ride onwards, jockeys across the country are warned that the rules of racing prohibit them passing on inside information or tips about the races they're competing in. The jockeys are not permitted to tip and, and under the rules jockeys can't receive any benefit at all, whether it be financial benefit or otherwise, from anyone other than the owners of the horses. So. Um, it's generally considered that, uh, you know, jockeys are there to, to ride the horses and give them every possible chance of winning, but uh, they're not in the game for uh, tipping horses and receiving benefits from doing that. In 1995, Australian racing faced a very public crisis. Revelations that police phone taps had caught Sydney jockeys passing inside information to the head of a drug syndicate and allegedly fixing races hit the headlines in what became known as the jockey tape scandal. This government is determined to drive corruption from racing. They won't catch Jimmy Cassidy, he's spears away, running home late, sir Valentino, hot Zephyr in front and he's going to make it six, Cassidy, the man's a genius. At the centre of the scandal, one of the biggest names in Australian racing, jockey Jim Cassidy who rode Kiwi from last place to a celebrated win in the 1983 Melbourne Cup. And here's Kiwi! Kiwi is flying! And Kiwi got up to win the Cup from Noble Comet and Mr Jazz. 6am, Rose Hill Racecourse. Another opportunity for Jim Cassidy to talk to the horses he'll be riding at the weekend. By talking to the animal itself and, and letting it have confidence in you nine times out of ten, um, you've always got full control. You got any when the Australian Jockey Club launched its own inquiry into the jockey tape scandal, Jim Cassidy admitted he hadn't just been discussing race tactics with his mounts. How are you feeling, Jim? He's got no comment. Oh, no, just... AJC oh. Chief Steward John Shrek who led the investigation into the fine cotton scandal a decade earlier, brought disciplinary charges against Jim Cassidy and two other jockeys implicated by the phone taps. He was not surprised that a subsequent New South Wales Crime Commission investigation found insufficient evidence to lay criminal charges. John Shrek maintains it's virtually impossible for a corrupt jockey to guarantee that a horse will win, but it is possible to manipulate the outcome of a race. You can turn a good thing into a certainty by running the race in a way to suit the good thing. And so therefore, the manipulation of a race is not impossible. Um, unfortunately, I'd like to tell you that it is, but it's not. The stewards found Jim Cassidy guilty of conduct prejudicial to racing by pretending to fix races in return for money and disqualified him from setting foot on a racetrack for three years. 
he was making this suggestion to the person, the drug dealer guy, that uh, he could fix races and all sorts of things. Um, and of course he, he wasn't doing that and he couldn't do that. Um, he wasn't able to do that. Cassidy was just conning the guy and successfully, um, which is not to Jim Cassidy's credit, of course, but uh, that was what was going on. Jim Cassidy appealed against his disqualification which was later reduced to a 20-month suspension. There's life after racing, but uh, Jimbo will be back. Don't worry about that. Might and Power, the leader. Doremus is coming at him. Doremus after Might and Power. Might and Power and Doremus, they hit it. Oh, it's close. Doremus runs. Doremus runs from the outside. Kenny have done it a second time. By 1997, Jim Cassidy was back on the track and celebrating his second Melbourne Cup victory on Might and Power. Yes, that is one of the great finishes in Melbourne Cup history. He was also forging a relationship with another big punter who would soon earn an even bigger reputation as a major drug trafficker. His name was Tony Mockbelt. Thanks, guys. He was big. Uh, he was a big player. Um, he was wagering enormous amounts of money, uh, not only in Victoria, but right around Australia. Tony Mockbell and Bob Trimboli were very similar. Then they loved the races, but they were both extremely personable men. They were likeable. People liked to be with them. Yeah, well, that was the surreal thing. Leading crime reporter and author John Sylvester, who documented Melbourne's deadly gangland wars, witnessed Mockbell's rise in the late 1990s. <laughs> As his drug empire grew, Mockbell became a regular at the racetrack with a crew of cronies nicknamed the Tracksuit Gang who put down large cash bets on his behalf. These were a group of men who would place bets on horses up and down the eastern seaboard in a plunge uh, on one occasion, all with sort of old $100 notes. And when they won, they demanded to be paid with new $100 notes. And the Piranha Task Force believed that the Mockbell industry, the company, put through $80 million in gaming over this period of time. Tony Mockbell's influence was not confined to the betting ring. Despite being charged with drug trafficking in 1998 and again in 2001, Mockbell was being seen around Melbourne, keeping company with leading jockeys. Victoria's Chief Steward Des Gleeson became so concerned he warned both Jim Cassidy and his younger rival, champion jockey Danny Nicklick, to stay away from Mockbell. We spoke to quite a number of licensed persons, not only jockeys, trainers as well, and advised them to be careful with who they uh, associate with. Do you think Mockbell was getting inside mail from jockeys? Um, no, I, I, I don't think so. Mr Mockbell um, won money, he lost money, he... Um, he was a big player, but he wasn't always successful. Um, he lost huge amounts of money from time to time. Um, and I think he was a, an impulse uh, punter as well. Um, but uh, we've no evidence that he was getting information from, from jockeys now. But Des Gleeson did not know all that was going on behind the scenes. He readily admits he was working with one arm tied behind his back, without police powers to tap phones examine bank accounts or launch full police-styled investigations. The stewards don't have the powers that the police have. We don't have powers to intercept phone calls or anything like that. We don't have powers to, as I said, speak to unlicensed person. Um, and that's where we need the cooperation of the civil authorities um, if the need arises. As Mockbell's reach into the sport grew, racing officials formally asked police for help on two occasions, but their pleas fell on deaf ears. When the racing squad was disbanded in late 90s, there was a, a complete void until basically 2005, where we received uh, very little information, if any information at all, from the civil authorities. And that was disappointing from our perspective. And during that period, Mockbell was growing his presence in racing? He was, yes. Uh, he, he was at that time, certainly. He's, uh, um, he was certainly gaining momentum during that period. Now they're set, they're racing. With the police effectively sidelined, Mockbell's relationship with the jockeys, trainers and bookies blossomed and suspicions grew. 
clearly mock Bell because of being privileged with information. He got four to one and seven to two and three to one. And uh, Joe Public wandering in and out of his TAB each day or getting onto his phone account for the, um, for the market mover, uh, he'd be copying the $3 or $3.10. And there's the advantage to be had from uh, so-called inf inside information. A 50-year veteran of trackside punting, John Knott often saw the tracksuit gang in action as they laid big bets for Tony Mockbell. I noticed that when he backed a Cassidy mount, it went particularly well, often won or ran very well. But when he backed two or three others in a race and Cassidy was riding one of the short-priced runners, I'll say it never won or almost never won, Leading bookie Frank Hudson had no qualms about taking Tony Mockbell's cash, even while Mockbell was free on a million dollars bail after being arrested and charged with running a billion dollar drug empire. After this photograph of Mockbell placing bets with Hudson was published by Melbourne's Herald Sun in 2004, authorities finally moved to ban Mockbell from the track. There was certainly nothing done until the photo appeared in the paper. I mean, he was standing beside Frank Hudson and it was a, almost a posed photo. So uh, it was no secret. It was only amid the growing death toll of Melbourne's gangland war that Tony Mockbell's empire was systematically targeted by a new police task force named Piranha. Before Piranha came along, uh, how focused was the Victoria Police in dealing with this Mockbell corruption and racing issue? Well, they weren't. Um, basically, the, the police department had dropped the ball on, on uh, anything to do with the racing industry. There was no racing squad. There was nobody monitoring what was happening on the track. It became, basically, we were, it was a periphery to the investigation we were doing. So, um, yeah, there was, there was nothing. In 2005, the Piranha Task Force got a new boss, Inspector Jim O'Brien. O'Brien's priority was uncovering Mockbell's involvement in drug trafficking and murder, as well as targeting his assets. Piranha discovered Mockbell was cleaning drug money by betting with bookmakers in a manner that would avoid the attention of anti-money laundering agency Oztrac. We're well aware of his connection with racing in Victoria. But um, a lot of the time it was about using others to place those bets on his behalf and breaking down the amounts of those bets so that they weren't subject to Oztrack reporting uh, by bookmakers. There was information uh, being passed on from people within the racing industry to uh, certain individuals that uh, probably uh, placed bets on uh, a knowledge basis that, uh, that, that put them ahead of the average punter that people uh, were um, utilising uh, bookmakers that uh, illegally and that uh, probably uh, horses were uh, in a third party name and things such as that. There were phone taps that police had which connected um, uh, Tony with a number of jockeys and trainers. In fact, I think seven prominent racing officials ended up being subpoenaed to give evidence at the Australian Crime Commission when they started to follow the money. Before long, police moved in on Mockbell's assets, which ranged from sports cars to property worth millions of dollars. Tax authorities also took action in connection to a unit in this apartment tower, which was ostensibly owned by bookie Frank Hudson, but which Mockbell helped finance. Hudson was told to cough up unpaid tax linked to this property. Piranha also scrutinised the dealings of trainer Peter Moody, now famous as the trainer of Black Caviar. In late 2007, Moody was leasing stables owned by the Mockbell family. He'd also been training a horse called Pillar of Hercules, which was registered in the name of Moody's wife and the wife of a Mockbell family associate. But according to a Supreme Court affidavit lodged by Piranha, the $475,000 horse had in fact been purchased by Tony Mockbell's brother Horty and its ownership details falsified so as to avoid detection by police. It was paid for by money that was delivered in garbage bags. Um, a bit of a, a red flag, you'd think. 
or you'd think that it's not the normal way people do business. In October 2007, Piranha seized Pillar of Hercules, alleging in the same affidavit the thoroughbred was bought as part of a large-scale money laundering operation in an attempt to cover up the extent of monies derived from drug trafficking. That was one instance where we did work closely with the Victoria Police who gave us information in relation to the ownership of the horse and uh, we immediately stopped it from racing and the horse was sold. Do you think the trainer in question had questions to answer about his role in the affair? Oh, we did question Mr Meady um, at length about the whole scenario, but um, no action was taken against Mr Meady at the time, no. Why not? No evidence to support the charge being laid. Piranha investigators also began to zero in on the money Mockbell was paying jockeys. Four Corners has confirmed they gathered evidence that Mockbell had paid tens of thousands of dollars in secret commissions to jockeys in return for tips. Piranha identified at least two leading jockeys on the Mockbell payroll. Why was it helpful for Mockbell to have that inside information? Well, it's helpful in relation to him being able to launder his assets. I suppose if he's got an odds-on favourite, it's going to, even if it's very short money, if he puts up $20,000 and gets 21000 or 22000 back, he's still, he's cleaned that money. He's got some, he's got something to show, oh, all this money I won on a bet, or, you know, I had the bet on such and such a date and here's a record of it and I can call that bookmaker uh, a trial if I ever get charged. <laughs> Four Corners has confirmed that Jim Cassidy privately admitted to investigators that he'd received almost $100,000 from Mockbell in exchange for tips. But publicly, Cassidy has denied any improper dealings with Mockbell, instead calling him a friend who he respected. Even in those days, the whole world knew that Mockbell wasn't much chop, and I think it would have been better for a high-profile race rider like Jim Cassidy to have been saying different things from that. In 2007, investigators also documented allegations that, like Cassidy, Danny Nicolick had enjoyed Mockbell's largesse. Nicolick rode at least five horses owned by Mockbell or his associates, but publicly denied ever leaking him any inside mail. No evidence to the contrary was ever produced. Piranha's investigation should have been a wake-up call for racing. In a way, it was. The Victorian government commissioned a report from a former judge, Gordon Lewis, which drew on Piranha's investigation into Mockbell to conclude that criminal activity in racing was rampant. Lewis's 2008 report called for an overhaul in the policing of the sport, finding that bookmakers, trainers and jockeys had improper associations with known criminals. Racing now, splendid choice to the inside and style music. The two but since the release of the Lewis report, not a single bookmaker, jockey or trainer has faced any serious repercussions over their dealings with Tony Mockbell. Note with Hossa Moore winning and Jimmy Cassidy on board. How many people in racing, jockeys, trainers, bookies, licensed people, actually have been held to account over their dealings with Tony Mock? None that I know of. Does that surprise you? Yeah, it is surprising. Oh, steady, boys. The way Hong Kong dealt with the case of champion Australian jockey Chris Muntz in 2006 stands in stark contrast to the failure of Australian racing to investigate jockeys, trainers and bookies linked to Tony Mockbell. Oh, come on boys, out the line. The Melbourne Cup winning rider was detained at his house on Monday just hours before he was scheduled to board a flight to Australia. Chris Muntz was arrested with betting details and thousands of dollars in cash in his pockets after lengthy surveillance by Hong Kong's Independent Commission Against Corruption. Muntz was one of seven people arrested after an investigation by Hong Kong's corruption watchdog, the Independent Commission Against Corruption. Those detained included four suspected illegal bookmakers. ICAC alleges Muntz either received or stood to receive almost $300,000 in exchange for tips he provided. In the Muntz case, he was deemed to be an employee of the owner of the horse 
and he was selling that information to others for profit and therefore was in breach of the law of the land and went to jail for it. Was that a harsh penalty? Oh, no, not at all, in my opinion, not at all. Now, he knew uh, what the situation was when he went there, as all of them do that, that go there. And uh, if you do the crime, you do the time. Chris Munce was convicted and served 20 months in jail. The Hong Kong Jockey Club gave him an additional suspension, which should have prevented him from riding anywhere in the world for almost a year after his release. But New South Wales racing authorities allowed him back on the track with 10 months of his suspension still to run. The penalty wasn't reciprocated by Racing New South Wales. It was by all the other states of Australia, but not by Racing New South Wales. And so he was allowed to ride back in Australia pretty well straight away. Um, the whole thing was most unfortunate. It should never have happened that way. Without the investigative backup enjoyed by their Hong Kong counterparts, in 2010, Victorian racing authorities were forced to ask again for police help. Steward suspected that Danny Nicklick was breaching the rules of racing by passing inside information about his mounts. Four Corners can reveal that, once again, the Victoria Police declined to help and left the stewards to go it alone. Authorities were alerted to Nicolik's activities after suspicious bets were placed with the betting exchange Betfair, which allows punters to bet on horses losing. Uh, we'll to clear, clear my name. The Racing Disciplinary Board found there was insufficient evidence to prove the charges against Nicolik, and he was cleared. I was quietly confident. Well, I know that I've done nothing wrong, so I was just hoping that the RAD Board would see it my way and and, I, you know, I'm, I'm very happy now. Were the racing authorities correct to bring the case, given they lost? Ah, oh, yes. I think that was uh, clearly vindicated by the Appeals and Disciplinary Board when they heard the charges. The circumstantial evidence, if you like, was very, very strong, and the board said that they were very justified in um, pre preparing that case. What couldn't the racing authorities get in terms of evidence, and, and why couldn't they get it? Look, I think it's fair to say that the content of the conversations uh, between Danny and the people that were putting the bet on was the, the missing part. Which is the horse we're looking at, Paul? We're looking at the, the, uh, the one that's second from the inside out of what we'll call their barrier five. If you just watch uh, the action of the jockey, um, this should uh, pretty well explain what I was talking about earlier. Okay, so Sal Perna is Victoria's yeah. full-time Racing Integrity Commissioner a role so, created as a result of the Lewis the report. Yeah, sort of it's the first appointment of its type in the country. So is he allowing himself to get boxed in there? Yeah, we'll While Sal Perna horses. enjoys only limited investigative powers of his own, he's been striving to get police and racing officials to work together. Did you find when you first arrived that police were sitting on information about corruption in racing that was not being passed to racing authorities and vice versa? Yeah, I think that's a fair comment. Um, Part of the, the difficulty with police releasing information is that some information is protected by legislation, uh, telephone intercepts, for example, and that information can't be given to non-law enforcement areas. Unbeknown to Sal Perna, a new controversy featuring some familiar names was just around the corner. After the death of Les Samba early last year, Danny Nicklick continued riding, knowing he was under police scrutiny. On the 12th of April, homicide detectives raided the home of his brother John, a former horse trainer based on Queensland's Gold Coast. Two weeks later, Danny Nicklick was here at Cranbourne, preparing for his ride on Smoking Aces. Racing, great line out. Tycoon the race favourite was Retaliate. Uh, me, who's back on the fence. Retaliate's got horses all around him. He's last. Also riding in the race was jockey Mark Zara on By Cal. Four Corners can reveal that police are investigating whether Nikolic and Zara had allegedly conspired to reduce Retaliate's chances of winning and improve Smoking Aces' prospect of success. Smoking Aces wins first up from Retaliate, due by Opera third from Mesmerite. Figures linked to the race have alleged to Four Corners that associates of Nikolic had bet heavily on his mount and that police have recently been quizzing jockeys, trainers and punters about the ride in question. 
trifecta, $429.10. First call with number one. one. At a recent race meeting, Four Corners tried to interview Danny Nicklick, who'd just ridden a series of winners. Danny, I'm uh, Nick McKenzie from Four Corners. We're not actually here to ask you about today's race. No, We're right. here to ask you about, about smoking aces, Danny. Can I just ask you a couple of questions about smoking aces? Is Danny Nicklick a person of interest in the race-fixing investigation? As I said, it's a current investigation, and uh, we'll, uh, you know, I can't comment on that particular phase of it at this stage. Jockey Mark Zara also declined to answer questions about the Cranbourne race. Racing sources have confirmed to Four Corners that associates of Nicolick in Melbourne and interstate made bets on smoking aces that earned them a combined total of up to $200,000. Well, G'day, well, my name's Nick McKenzie. I'm a reporter from uh, Four Corners ABC TV. I'm investigating a certain race uh, which I believe you had something to do with at Cranbourne last year the, involving the ride of smoking aces. Can I ask you a few questions about that? Four Corners tried to speak with one punter linked to the win. Oh, he's hung up. We know that there are a number of identities that we need to talk to interstate and uh, bits and pieces, but at this particular stage we're concentrating on Victoria, but there are a number of areas that we know that we need to have a look at. No, I think, uh, you, you... Detective Superintendent Jerry Ryan is overseeing the police inquiry into the alleged race fixing and the Samba murder. He's revealed to Four Corners he's called in Piranha to tackle the fresh allegations of corruption. We'll leave no stone unturned. So that means we'll look at a number of races and you know, a number of areas that uh, unfold a as the investigation goes. But it's important to, at the end of this investigation to make sure that the integrity in racing here in Victoria and nationally is squeaky clean. Basically, Whatever the outcome of that investigation, the former head of Piranha, Jim O'Brien, says authorities are yet to prove they can effectively combat corruption in sport. How good has that job of protecting the integrity of racing been, in your view? It, it's not been good at all. It's been very ex uh, extremely poor and uh, in part brought about because, uh, you know, the, the stewards themselves who look after those codes haven't got the teeth. Um, they're not investigators for a start. But Jerry Ryan says authorities in Victoria have learned from the mistakes of the past. Look, uh, Yes, we can say that we did take our eye off the ball and that's why Piranha uh, is so strong today because we, we realised that uh, we needed to get back into uh, this arena when, when we have. And those who say that the police will never be able to, to, to catch a race fix, they're not up to the task? Well, that's what they said about the gangland slings and uh, what, what's happened there. We've put them all behind bars. Victoria's Racing Integrity Chief Sal Perna says that even if state police and racing officials get it right, if the rest of the country doesn't follow suit, it will be for nothing. If you're a jockey in Victoria at the moment, you know, you can go into state and possibly have far less scrutiny over your activities. Yes, I'd agree with that. And how unhealthy is that? Well, it can't be good. Um, it, 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 uh, it creates uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, and we don't want that. We want the same standard to apply when it comes to integrity right across the board. In New South Wales, two harness racing stewards and a trainer are facing criminal charges over alleged corruption. The state's greyhound racing industry also has a history tainted by scandal. So this is the letter you wrote the Minister. Last year, the New South Wales government appointed former Ombudsman David Lander to oversee the integrity of both racing codes. But within months, he quit both posts, believing his role amounted to window dressing. I felt that apart from the role being uh, ineffective and not capable of performing what I felt the legislatures may have intended, uh, it, was, it was a fiction and it was a fraud, really, on the public. A fraud on the public? Yes, because they were led to believe that there was an integrity auditor capable of dealing with issues that ought to be dealt with, matters of integrity, matters of honesty, matters of fair dealing, and those powers were not able to be performed. In the new world of internet betting, people can bet to win or lose and on any number of other outcomes, in almost any sport, anywhere.
They create opportunities for people to um, corrupt players to do certain things that they can benefit from by betting on. Uh, we've also got a new model now with betting exchanges uh, where you can actually bet on an animal to lose and that hasn't been part of the Australian culture today so they do present challenges. The explosion of internet and exotic betting has sparked debate about the policing of sport across the country. Horse racing's not too bad. Uh, there are things go on that's, that's simply inexcusable, of course there are. But generally speaking, it's not too bad. Um, so I don't think there's any need for any national integrity controller over the sport, no. I think the state should be left to their own devices. That's the way it's been for 150 years and I think it's been pretty good. Does there need to be a national body? I think there does. So we can work together on it and address issues not only nationally but internationally. It's about bringing in specialists that are specialist investigators, uh, specialist analysts and wagering analysts and bringing in all the bodies together so they can share information and work out how to do it in a concerted way. The iron law of crime is where there is a demand there will be a supply. Uh, as soon as the Tony Mockbell is locked up there is someone else to take their place. So it's about getting the structures right with racing because right now there'll be somebody somewhere chatting to a jockey, trying to get some inside information. And if he's got a pocket full of drug money, then he's got a better chance of getting the answer he wants to hear. Tony Mockbell is now serving a 30-year prison sentence for drug trafficking. But there's another Mockbell still on the punt. His brother, Horty, another convicted drug trafficker, has been banned from racetracks and the casino by order of the Victorian government. But over several weeks, Four Corners observed him and a group of fellow punters in tracksuits placing numerous bets at a suburban Melbourne TAB. Horty Mockbell's regular companions include underworld identity and racehorse owner Paul Sequenzia. Sequenzia, the brother-in-law of murdered gangster Mark Moran, had drug trafficking charges dropped in 2004. Sequenzia is part owner of a horse called M. Maguan. In 2009, it became one of the first horses in Australia to test positive for the performance-enhancing drug EPO. In the racing world, Tony Mockbell's place is most likely already filled. There's plenty of success in planning and criminal organisations and someone else will just step up and fill his shoes, so it won't go away. Now it's not just a matter of Tony Mockbell or Bob Trimboli, but it could be um, a crime syndicate from anywhere in the world who could target a sport, one game, one event, one cricket match, one over, one ball, and that's the new challenge. Despite commitments from the federal and state governments, there are still no specific laws dealing with match or race fixing. Without a national sports integrity body, some states and sports remain well behind the others when it comes to confronting the challenge of corruption. How urgent are those changes needed? Well, I think they should have been done yesterday, but as soon as possible, um, before there'll be an almighty scandal in, in sport in Australia. That scandal may have already arrived. The fallout from Les Samba's murder and allegations of corruption at the highest levels in racing still has a long way to run. Certainly, uh, I believe that if we were able to solve the race fixing and uh, solve the issues that are, that are emerging, we'll certainly so solve the murder. Are you confident the murder of Les Samba will be solved? I'm confident it will be solved, yes. Four Corners asked jockeys Danny Nikolic and Mark Zara to comment on the allegations raised. Both declined. Bookie Frank Hudson and jockey Jim Cassidy also declined to be interviewed. Four Corners also asked trainer Peter Moody to talk about his dealings with Haughty Mockbell. He also declined. Next week on Four Corners, an investigation into the international trade in human tissue, its ethics and its regulation. Until then, good night. <laughs>